Namo Saranto Suche Doye, Ola Hudi Samyo Samputosye. Namo Saranto Suche Doye, Ela Hedi Samyo Samputosye. Namo Saranto Suche Doye, Ela Hedi Samyo Samputosye. The unsurpassed, deep, profound, subtle, wonderful Dharma in a hundred thousand million aeons is hard, is difficult to encounter. Now that I've come to receive and hold it within my sight and hearing, I vow to fathom the thus come one's true and actual meaning. All Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, Venerable Shinoa, all good knowing advisors, Amitofo. Um, (laughs) 
when I decided to agree to lecture for you, I was hoping that I would be able to uh, add my understanding of the Mahayana Sutras in English for you. Maybe clarify things that uh, Venerable Shenhua, which uh, who has explained the Mahayana Sutra extensively, things that he didn't have time to go into for you, or things that uh, uh, that you read somewhere else that you have uh, some questions or doubts about, and um, maybe add a few more things that uh, they left out on purpose, depending on the needs of the, of the listening audience. Some, some things were not proper to explain. So, uh, things maybe had, had, uh, had better off uh, waiting for uh, another time. So when I started lecture last week, I started with a, by making a big boo-boo. And I would like tonight to sincerely apologize a lot for my mistake. I made a mistake last week when I started a lecture, and I'm very sorry about that. I, after lecturing, I came back to the house, crossed my legs, and contemplated a lecture. I realized that I said something was very wrong. I said that this very these very verses for opening a sutra were, this is what I heard from a lecture at the CTTB, City of 10,000 Buddhas, about 10 years ago, from a lecture. And during a lecture, the Dharma Master explained that this verse is really was penned by the Empress, uh, Empress Wu. Uh, and that's all true. What I left out, which I, uh, which was incomplete in my database is that my databanks is that I gave you the false impression that she created these verses. She did not. Okay. That's the part that's wrong. Okay. These verses are actually part of the Mahayana teaching. So Empress Wu, when she was asked to uh, put her own uh, put a forward on the printing of the Buddhist sutras back then. She probably crossed the legs like many of you did. And then she contemplated and she said, what can I say at the very forefront of everything else in the Buddhist sutras that would really add to it and not subtract from it? All right. So she came up with this with beautiful wisdom of using this. This is actually a mantra in Buddhism that uh, that is taught by the Buddha. This is actually part of the, the uh, flower adornment uh, sutra. So that's part that's wrong. All right. She did not create this. All right. So I again, I want to apologize for giving you that false impression. I will try to be more careful and clean up my database, my references in the future. Um, and I go more into these things. This is not the end of it. I will explain more why I, I uh, add to this apology later on in the, in, in the lectures. All right. Any questions? Again, I apologize for misleading you. The, se the second line of that is, makes a comment about the Dharma. And yeah. Last week, you, you, you asked us about Dharmas. Yes. And told us essentially that they are everything and nothing. Yes. And I understand that, but how, they're, they're so closely related to and, and, and are the sutras where they are the Buddhist thoughts. And so does, does that just simply mean that the Dharma, since they are words, are still emptiness, and even though they are the sutras? Got it mixed up. Does anyone understand his question? Because I don't. <laughs> Included, <right? laughs> okay. What is that you're not clear about? Dharma's, dharma's and the uh, uh, question of Paramita. 
because the parts of the body are, are described as uh, no characteristics, not produced, not destroyed, okay. uh, and and are emptiness. All right. And they are the, yet they are the doctrine. And I, I we we are we are paying so much attention to them when we talk about the learning and what we're going on. Is that just because they're the only vehicle to get the information of the sutras across? No. And therefore they aren't they aren't to be beatified, they're just words. Um in essence, the, the, the Buddha's teaching is, uh, can really not be described in words. All right. What, when you become enlightened, that state of enlightenment, that understanding, that deep, profound wisdom there cannot be described, cannot be described by words. Okay. Sure. So what, what, what happens? What can you do? What can we do? Okay. We don't understand until we hear, it, until things are explained to us, right? But what he understands is beyond description. That's a problem, big problem. So that when the Buddha was enlightened, that's what happened to him. He sat there in deep meditation, in deep samadhi, and he said, hmm, what I understand is so profound. So deep, and yet these guys out there are so dumb. Well, it's not in those terms, okay? That, that, and and they're not willing to listen. They're not. They 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 don't have they don't have enough wisdom to understand my level of wisdom. I'm right here, up here, and they're way down there. It's too far apart. So what to do? So what he did is that he said, "No, this is too much trouble. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to lecture. I'm not going. I won't even bother trying to explain things to them because it's just they're not willing to listen." Okay. And what happened is that a god from the first Diana heaven. Okay, he's the king from the first Diana heaven. All right, he's the most. In our design, in, in our triple realm, the Saha world, there are two god kings who are very, very, very uh, well known. One is a Christian god. All right, the Christian god is uh, is uh, Allah, or whatever. It's the same god. Okay, he's most well known because uh, he's uh, a very gregarious. He gets along with a lot of living beings, people, and gods. And he goes everywhere. He loves to listen to dharmas as well. That's why he's known, he's recognized by a lot of people. And he's, he's a good, good, good person, really. And then the other god is a god of the first dhyana, which is, has much more power than, than the Christian god. Much more, much more spiritual powers. Okay. And much more wisdom as well. As you can imagine. This is the wisdom of a, a dhyana heaven king. Versus a wisdom of a king in the second heaven of the desire realm. Okay? That's a lower realm. Much lower realm. So, the God King of the first Diana uh, heaven realized that. So, he, he manifests, he appeared in front of the Buddha, bowed to him three times. Okay? Circle ambulated around him. Numerous times and did what we, what, what you were taught, requested Dharma. Okay. That's how the Buddha said, someone requested me to teach him. I can't say no. He knows how to request the Dharma. And therefore, the Buddha agreed to teach him. That's when he agreed to begin to lecture on sutras, to explain his teaching. Okay. That's how it came about. So, what did he do? We depend on words, on sounds, to understand. Okay? And that's what the Buddha used. Okay? So what he did is he used, he, he was describing the words that, using the words that we understand 
the added vocabulary that we don't have in our existing vocabulary to describe the process of practice. Because he says, if you follow my teachings, if you do what I tell you to do, you too will get into samadhi. You too will also develop your wisdom. You too will attain the same level of wisdom as I have. My wisdom is your inherent wisdom is no different. All right, all right. It's what is called in Buddhism, the Buddha nature. The Buddha nature is inherent in all of us. That's what makes us all equal. Men, women, child, old people. Even the Buddha nature is present in the animal realm. But that's what makes us equal as well in that sense. Okay? So, even though we have the Buddha nature, inherently we are enlightened. But because of ignorance, that wisdom is being covered. So the, the practice in Mahayana is the process of uncovering those coverings. All right? So that you recover your original wisdom. If you can do that, you are a Buddha. The Buddha is a person who finally remove all the coverings, all the darkness in our mind. All right? That's called ultimate enlightenment. So, even though, even though when you get there, there's not a whole lot that can be said. There's this Chinese saying, when you are confused, a thousand volumes are not sufficient to describe it. Where once enlightened, one single word is too many. That's what the Chan school calls not relying on words. The teaching is transmitted outside of words. They use mind-to-mind -mind seal to certify or to transmit the teaching. At times, we also add words to help make it easier for you to speed up your progress. All right? So, in essence, the words actually are expedient means that the Buddha used to help us understand. Any question? Does it, does it help clarify a little so bit? So, once we understand... Once we understand, so what happened is that I get into that. Let, let me get to that. Okay, let me. Okay, you 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 are stealing my my thunder here. You're forcing me to explain things quicker than I'm willing to, because I I I want to go through the process of 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 uh, of uh, unveil, unveiling for you. Well, do, do it Okay, I come, I come to that in about 10, 15 minutes, if you don't mind. All right, anything else? Any other questions? No, feel free to ask questions, and I will try to answer the, all your questions in my lecture, either immediately or down the road. If you still feel that you, your question is not answered yet, by all means, ask me again. Okay? I try to clarify for you. This sutra we try to explain here is a sutra in 42 sections. Okay. This is um, the word sections, 42 sections really means this sutra here is actually a compilation of the, Bo the Buddha's disciples. After he, he, he died, the, the, his disciples looked into his, his, all his teachings and picked out the things that they liked. And they put it together and they came up with about 42 different, different dharmas that they felt are pretty important. And they put that together and call it a sutra in 42 sections. So actually this sutra here, is not directly spoken by the Buddha, but actually is a collection of the Buddha's thoughts. And they collected 42 different dharmas, okay, in his teaching. And the sutra is very important because the very first sutra that was transmitted from India to China. 
when the Buddha was enlightened in India 3,000 years ago, approximately, very auspicious events occurred in China even. India and China are so far apart. And yet in India, by the, at the time that the Buddha was born, in China, the river overflowed the banks. And there's a very bright sh light that shines that people can see. Okay? So the emperor back then, the Chinese emperor back then, asked his astrologer, his prime minister, his astro astrologer for an explanation. And they consulted. Uh, a Chinese uh, Chinese uh, method of divination, divining things. Is it divination? Okay. They it's that that the uh, Dharma is called the I Ching. If you use the I Ching, you understand the I Ching. You can use it and really interpret, understand a lot of things in the past, in the present, as well as down the road. I'll give you an example. My brother Viet uh, hangs around with a lot of weirdos, Taoists, uh, Buddhists, uh, you name it. He hangs around with them. And one of them is a specialist in I Ching. They would go to these, these coffee shops, not Vietnamese Starbucks, and they sat there and gab and, and talk and, and gossip. And this guy here, specialist in I Ching, look at his, his friend, which is leaving, he says, you know, the, the, those, those people who hang around and say, I'm leaving. I'm, I, I need to go somewhere. This eating special expert looked at him and said, be careful. Watch out for car accidents. <laughs> Speaking of car accidents, <laughs> did you hear that? <laughs> and the guy, really? And the guy, oh, you, there he goes again. So this guy walked out and hopped in his car, got out of the parking lot and got into a car accident just a block away. So the I Ching has, if you, you, you the, these very, the Chinese have a lot of really wonderful dharmas that, that give you superior knowledge, okay? And I Ching is one of them. So anyway, back then the, the Chinese emperor asked his, his, uh, his uh, astrologer and he used I Ching the divine and he said, a very wise man was born in India, was recently born in India. They said, so the emperor said, oh, that's wonderful. Back then, the emperors sought out wise people to help rule the country, okay, to help teach the people. Today is different, okay, today education is completely ignored because you can get away with it. Back then, the emperor was not elected. The emperor was inherited. And as because it's in her, his inheritance or her inheritance, they want to make sure they do the right things to be able to preserve the countries. It's theirs. Okay, it's not like they're going to be there for six years and four years and then they be gone. Like in France, have a new president, then he's going to be there for six years and then he'll be gone after six years. Okay, so maybe so. This emperor, the Chinese emperors back then would seek out the wise men and bring them to their country, okay, to help to become their, like, a senior advisor to the king or even a national master, meaning they're the teacher of the kings and the emperors, okay? So anyway, the, the Chinese emperor said, so what can I do to invite him over here to enlighten us, to help us out? Okay, to help me do the right things to govern my country, to help me, uh, to help me do good for my people. The, the astrologer said, I'm sorry, your majesty. This, uh, this, uh, wise man's teaching is not going to come to China for another thousand years. It's no use. You could send people over there, over there right now to seek them out but it's not going to be available to us for at least another thousand years. So the Chinese emperor trusted his advisor as a good king should do. And then he, he carved it into stone to record the actual event. So the Buddha's birth was recorded in Chinese history. 
And then 80 years later, when the Buddha died, passed away, okay, China was also aware of that, okay? And they also re recorded that in their historical books as well. All right? So, so a thousand years later, surely enough, the emperor was ready. He said, I want to bring back the Buddhist philosophy to China to benefit my country. So he sent 18 people, 18, 18 envoys. Back then, India, to go from India to China, it's very uh, arduous. They probably have to go to Afghanistan, those big giant Buddha that's blown up. They probably have to go through that and climb mountains desert, and deserts. And so it's a very, very perilous journey. And yet these 18 people came to India and then ran into two people called Venerable Kashyapa Matanga and Gobarana, two Indian guys, two Indian shramanas, monks. And we requested them to, to bring back the Indian teaching to China. These two venerable monks graciously agreed, all right? So they brought back, excuse me, they brought back a whole caravan of Indian sutras in Sanskrit with these two monks. And the, and the sutras that they brought back were by the time they got back to the capital, which is Luoyang in China, which is the capital of the country back then, the sutra got there in a white horse. The white horse was carrying the sutras on its back. So the emperor was very, very grateful. He built immediately, um, built a, a monastery to house the sutras and called the monastery White Horse Monastery. All right. And that's where he gave the imperial command to translate the sutras from Sanskrit into Chinese. That's what happened. And the very first thing, the very first sutra was translated by these two Indian monks was a 42 section sutra. That's the nature of the sutra. All right. And so the, these two venerable monks are worked very hard for many years translating sutras. Okay. And it was doing well. At the, at the time, the Taoist was the prevalent. The Taoism was a prevalent religion in China. They have, they are favored by the Chinese emperor. Okay. They have, they can bend the emperor's ears. Okay. So four years after the, the Chinese sutras, the Sanskrit sutras made it to China, the more and more people became, believe in Buddhism and the emperor began to lean more towards Buddhism and Taoism. All right. The Taoists got jealous. So they, they got together. Uh, like the senators did a few months ago, and went and saw Miss, Mr. Emperor and said, you know, these Buddhists are bad guys. They're deviant <laughs> teachings. All right. You better change course. I'm going to prove to you that they are no good. Let's have a contest. Let me, let us show you, give us a chance to prove to you that Taoism is much better than Buddhism. Let's have a contest. The emperor said, okay, I, I sounds like fun. So the emperor uh, told the, the monks and said, okay, you're going to have a contest tomorrow, you know. <laughs> In the white, yeah, outside of white, uh, the White Horse Monastery, an east gate, east entrance, okay. I'm going to put the Taoist manuscripts. The Taoists, they, their teaching is called very sacred. They call sacred books. They also put their 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 different different things that are left behind from very famous Taoist masters. Okay, on the west entrance, they put the Buddhist sutras, 
and then some Buddhist rivers. All right. And then they put fire. They put fire to those two piles. And then before putting on lighting up the, the piles, the Taoist monks would pray to uh, uh, Lao Tzu, which is the founder of Taoism, and the various high, high level Taoist masters and say, please help us out. Please manifest your spiritual, spiritual powers to impress the emperor because it's a matter of life and death for our faith. Okay? Uh, in the process, they also showed off their spiritual skills. They, was, they were riding clouds to, to go to the place where they have this contest. They would show, uh, show off. They would disappear and appear at will. These Buddhist monks walk there, okay? Nothing impressive at all. The only thing that happened that would caught the emperor's attention was that the Taoist books went up in flames, but the Buddhist sutras did not. And even the Buddha Sharira started emitting lights forever bright and wonderful light. And for that, that's what saved Buddhism actually. Because if it weren't that, that case, they probably would have, would have, uh, would have, um, uh, um, expelled Buddhism from, from, from China. All right. So that's the nature of, of the, the, uh, the, the, the transmission. We, we, and later on, uh, Buddhism prospered and then died. In China, basically, it was on a decline, was about to be destroyed. And then that's when Venerable Xinhua was in, in that line of patriarchs. Okay? They transmit the teaching in the lineage. Uh, he brought the teaching, that Mahayana teaching, to America in the 60s. He didn't start teaching, propagating until six years later. All right. And this is one of the first few sutras that he explained as well. All right. Translated into English by the Buddhist Text Translation Society is uh, his disciples. They're very good people. They, uh, um, I highly recommend the translations because they, uh, they, uh, um, you do a real good job. You compare, you take any sutras that were translated by them and compare them to the translations from the other sources. You find out that, you find out that, that, um, there is much more accurate, much better. Okay. That's why I use their, the text. Um, uh, any any questions? When you, we when we explain sutras, one of the first three things we do is we ex we go through, we try to give you an overall explanation of what the, what the sutra is about, and we use the Tian Tai, the Tian Tai five fivefold profound meanings. Uh, methodology to do that. Tiantai is a very, very popular school in China that uh, 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 is well known for doing a real good job explaining Buddhist sutras. Okay, they go through uh, uh, five steps to to um, um, give you an overall idea what the sutra is about. The, the title itself alludes to sutra in 22 sections spoken by the Buddha is, uh, belongs to, to the cat category of the title that refers to a person, meaning the Buddha, because the Buddha is a person himself, and a dharma, a dharma meaning it's a, it's a method of, uh, or a Buddhist teaching. If, and actually, in this particular sutra here, there are 42 different major 
classes of dharma that are explained by the Buddha. So that's why the title is a type, dual typo, uh, dual type title, meaning that it refers to a person and a dharma. All right. Next time we talk about substance. What is the substance of the sutra? What the sutra is about is it explains the true mark. The true mark is what? Is true emptiness. That's what the Buddha's wisdom is. When you become enlightened with Mahayana, you understand about true emptiness or that's true mark. All right. The next thing we talk about is the doctrine. The doctrine of the sutra. What is this general teaching? This teaching is that basically we are all empty. All right. And when you reach that level of emptiness, okay, its nature is brightness. It's not darkness as compared to darkness. Okay? The nature of wisdom is brightness. All right? And what the sutra uh, function is to teach about precepts, exhort us to observe precepts, and then uh, end desires. All right. And the, and the final thing is that uh, what, what, what general groups of teaching does the sutra belong to? It belongs to the Vipulya period. That's uh, the, the Buddhist uh, teaching can be grouped into five period, five phases. The first phase is the immediately right after he became enlightened. For 21 days, he explained the Flower Adornment Sutra, the Avatamsaka Sutra to the Bodhisattvas. Okay, and crossed a lot of them over. That's only 21 days. And after that, the God King of the first Yana heaven, remember, came and requested Dharma. That's when he started to teach the Agama teaching. Agama is Sanskrit for um, Superior, no comparison. No comparison to what? To the existing teaching, to existing knowledge available in mankind or in, in, in the God's realm, in the heavenly realms. Whatever, uh, whatever teaching, whatever dharmas they practice, okay, is, is so inferior to this what the Buddha is about to teach. It's called the Agama teaching. Okay, he did that for 12 years. Okay, that teaching is also called a store teaching. And then he went into the Vipulya period, the Vipulya teaching. The Agama period is that he taught and transformed a lot of people and a lot of people became Ahats because they practiced the Agama Dharma. All right, and then what happened is that these people who reach the stage of ahadship have a lot, can go a lot further. So he started to teach them the next teaching called the Purulia period. The next level of ahad is to go into the Bodhisattva vehicle, meaning the Vajra vehicle, the fourth. Okay, so the Purulia period is a transitory teaching between the Ahat vehicle and the Bodhisattva vehicle. That's sort of more or less is explaining your question again. The teaching is based on our ability to absorb. For example, you don't teach, you don't take materials from college to teach in kindergarten. It's just not going to work. All right, it's the same thing here. It's, in fact, the Vipulya is a, a transitory teaching that basically says, listen, 
you attain hardship, which is really, really a wonderful attainment. This is incredible wisdom that you've attained so far. But don't be content. There's still so much more you can learn. Okay? And he began to explain that. He said, okay, uh, what I explained to you is really not the total picture. It's still more. So he began to explain more. I said, you can go, you can even unfold your wisdom further. Okay? So he started teaching by Bhuri, period. That's what the sutra as a group is, is classified as. It's part of that teaching called the connected teaching. With connecting between two major vehicles. All right. And then the fourth period is uh, Vipulia is uh, twen- uh, 22, uh, no, eight, eight years. No, yeah, eight years. And then Vasha uh, period is 22 years. That's uh, he teaches the Bodhisattva teaching, the, bo- the Bodhisattva vehicle. Okay. And finally, uh, the Lotus Nirvana period is uh, eight years. Uh, when he uh, taught the, the perfect teaching, he said, okay, even the Vashra teaching still has a lot of things that's not complete yet. You see, you guys thought, you, you guys Bodhisattva thought you know it all. Okay? No, you don't. It's still more. Okay? And he said, he then went about and explained and taught the Lotus Nirvana uh, uh, um, sutras. And then he died. He entered Nirvana. All right. So those are the five teachings. Any questions? Okay. Spoken by the Buddha. Spoken. Spoken is uh, you use your mouth. Okay. You make the sound. To connect, to reach out to others. Okay. But the way that he explained it is quite different, again, going back to your question. Okay. Dharma versus emptiness. Okay. There's a bridge between true emptiness and where we are. Okay. There's a way to get there. And he describes it. And the way he describes it is by explaining by using sounds, by, by opening his mouth, okay, and explain things. And the, the Buddha sounds are, when he explains sutras, are peculiar, quite different from ours, okay? They, that's why uh, when he explains sutras from his, his mouth, I mean, the way he sounds, they're, they're, he, what we call eight sounds, they're very, very different from our typical sounds, okay? For example, the first element is um, of all living beings, the sound he produces from his mouth is really the best sounding. It's none better. For example, for example, when you were born to Amitabha's Pure Land, you'll be hearing a sort of bird called Kala Vinka, Birds, you read it on, uh, in the sutras. We'll be uh, reciting sutras one of these days if we can last that long. Um, if there's interest, that is. Um, those sounds, those birds produce the best sounds, the most, the most pleasant to listen to. All right? Even that sound is not as good as the Buddha sound. Okay? Nowadays, you could consider maybe if you are a rock and roll person, you may think that Rolling Stone, Mick Jagger produces best sound, or you produce you you into uh, classical music or, or or operas. You might want uh, uh, Beverly Sills. Yeah, she she's pretty good, isn't she? She passed away, but she's a real real, real legend. Okay, so all the, Pavarotti and so on, all these people are basically the best sounds among humans. Okay? The Buddha's sound, the, Bo- from the sound of his voice, is the best of all living beings. That includes our hearts and bodhisattvas as well. All right? Why is that? It helps us. It excites us. 
and, and makes it not tiring to listen to him. You can listen to him on end uh, without getting tired, without getting bored. Okay. The second, the second uh, uh, aspect of his, his uh, voice is that the sound he produces very soft sounding. Okay. Uh, the soft sounding because it um, it's uh, subtle. It it's um, very subtle, which makes it. Um, impart joy. This is what the master ex- explained in part of what the master explained when he explained in the uh, Venerable Shira explained when he said the Buddha uh, uh, when he explains Sutra, when speaks, meaning that he he has this inner bliss, this inner joy that he can't he can't wait to to give it to you, to explain it to you. This is part of the nature of that. Okay. He, he's, he has a way, his son has a way of getting to us, okay, that makes us, makes it very, give us joy to listen to, okay. Number one, he, number one, good sounding make, makes us like to listen to him. But now number two is that it gives us joy to listen, creates joy in us, okay. And another aspect of, of the soft or the subtle sound subtle undulating voice that he has is that is that it makes us a, le- a lot less inflexible mentally so that we can accept it we can we, we don't reject it you see some of you would, uh, would sit there and say ah, I don't believe in this ah, I don't like that and you say and you, you shut it out in your mind and you, you, okay. So I have to find myself constantly, constantly reminding you, hey, don't, don't throw it away. Just shelve it for now, okay. The the Buddha never had to say that, okay. That's a difference in wisdom and and a voice production, okay. <laughs> because when he explained things to his audience, the audience would say, uh huh, hmm, that's interesting. They don't reject it. Okay? So it really softens them up, more or less. The third characteristic of his sound is this is suitable. Suitable to the time, to the place, to the living beings and who listen to, to him. Um, and because it reflects the middle way of the nature of the Dharma that he teaches. It is an extreme, on the extreme of, of emptiness or the extreme of, of annihilation. Okay? It's the middle way. The Buddha Dharma is the middle way. Therefore, it's suitable for people of all kinds of roots. All kinds of backgrounds. All right. And because it's suitable, it enables you to understand the principles, makes it easier for you to understand. So he imparts wisdom from even from his voice. Okay. The fourth one is venerated and wise. Zun Hui. Venerated refers to the Buddha's virtues. The Buddha's virtue is complete. He has cultivated all sorts of merit and virtues. So his virtues are all complete. There's nothing that, no virtue that he lacks. That's why he's very, very venerated. When you are virtuous, you invoke, you make people tend to, venerate you. Okay? That's why the whenever he speaks, that the sound itself embodies his virtues. That's why it's venerated. Okay? And wise. 
Why? It's because it embodies his ultimate wisdom. All right. The fifth one is not feminine. Okay. Not feminine meaning is masculine. Okay. I tell, I tell, give you a, tell you a really weird things happening right now in Mahayana. Whenever a person explains the, the Dharma, whenever a Sangha person, a level person like myself explains Dharma, if a monk explains the Dharma, you probably, unlike tonight, probably have a lot more people attending. If you have a nun, a nun explaining, the room is empty. You don't have a lot of people who are willing to listen. There is this thing about somehow the monks are, have, can draw a much bigger audience. Even though it doesn't necessarily mean that his kung fu is, or he knows more. It's just, it's just typically somehow they draw a bigger audience. Now, of course, there are always exceptions. There are nuns who can draw a much bigger audience than monks, than monks. Okay, but they tend to be the exception than the norm. For example, Venerable Shenhua has a uh, uh, high, very senior seated level nun who is American. Has been with him for a long, long time. Venerable Hung Chu. She will occasionally go to Long Beach Monastery to speak Dharma for them. She's wonderful. Let me tell you. If she comes, go and listen. I highly recommend it. She is so good in explaining things. Okay? She has this eloquence of explaining Dharma. But in, in general, when you speak Dharma, the masculine sound inspires more awe, makes it easier for people to accept. Okay? That's the nature of the, the Buddha sound. Not fem, fem, feminine because the women, when, when women, women produce sound, it's not as awe-inspiring as the, the male voice. All right? That's the nature of that. And why is it important? Because when you explain sutras, you explain uh, the religious philosophies to the audience, you, you tend to have a lot of people who are non-believers, especially the externalists, people who have some kung fu, people who have reached like the eighth level samadhi, they come and challenge you. They said, hmm. I disagree with you. What are you going to do about it? So it's a, a one-to-one -one kind of thing. You guys don't, are not aware of that. Okay? But it's a sort of a Dharma contest that goes on. Okay? That's a cool thing about, about, about Dharma lectures. A lot more going on than you realize. Okay? The Buddhas and Bodhisattvas will come here to support the assembly. That's why we offer incense to them. Now you know why you offer incense. See that? We show our reverence and our appreciation for them supporting us and shining the light on us to help unfold our wisdom by offering an incense stick and say, yes, thank you. And this is what we have as an offering to you. Now you know why we don't let the incense stick go out because that's how we show our appreciation and our respect for them, our veneration for them. All right. So the awe-inspiring awe aspect of the Dharma teaching is pretty important. You have to have some kung fu, and the sound itself can aid in the process. I give an example. I was listening to a Dharma master who was a disciple of, of Ven Bo Xinhua on the phone. I said, because he's my friend, Hunger Fashu. You know Hunger Fashu? That's the man 
that you give a ride back. Last year, a couple of years ago, when he was here to Long Beach, the second Long Beach location, I said, hmm, you, um, you haven't, uh, you, uh, you, you, you haven't got to the next step yet. This is very, very disappointing because you've been, you were at, uh, Second Diana a year ago. A year later, you're still there. What, what's the matter? Okay. I asked, I asked him. And I said, could you come to see me? Because I'd like to help you reach, and I need about a month. Okay. And if you can, come here for two weeks, I drive you back if I need to. If you don't get a ride back, I drive you back. Okay? Because I'd like you to reach this level. Okay? And, and right at that point in time, they were having a Dharma assembly at the city of 10,000 Buddhas. Okay? And, and during our conversation, I sort of told him that my students were doing well and they're reaching pretty high up there as well, you know. I haven't told you the current level yet. Uh, the, and he realized, hmm, these boys, these girls are working hard. This is my chance. I better work hard. A month later, he called me again. Okay. I listened to his sound of voice and I said, hmm, boy, he made it to the next level already. Third Diana. I haven't told him yet. Because I still wanted him to come. <laughs> so you by practicing, by me telling you this information, is only for your help as well as I use it to help others as well. Okay? We are in a network. We work together. Okay? By you making progress, you are actually helping others make progress as well. That's one example right there where they felt the pressure from you. And they said, hmm, I'm supposed to teach these guys. And if I don't progress, how can I? Okay? I'm letting my shifu down. Okay? So the voice carries your being. Does that make sense to you? Whatever your substance is, your essence is, it manifests itself in so many different ways. In the sound, in the light you emit, in... Oh, let me hold my thunder. It's a lot, so a lot, it's a whole lot more. Okay? So anyways, that's why the sound, the, when you, the, the not feminine sound is very important. Because feminine here is that it distracts people. Okay? If you listen to Venerable Hang Chu, for example, that American nun, okay? You can tell that her voice, her sound is not feminine. Let me tell you that. And that's it. Yes? That's a matter of training. No. I, it isn't. My degree is in speech, and we learned that. Speaking softly, mm -hmm. yeah, but that's and your the power that you can understand. We work to lower our voice. Yes, I, I can understand Asian women have much higher voices. Yes, but like Japanese women work to lower their voices. Yes, yes, especially as feminists came in to be yes. in the seventies. Women have to speak with See, this is an educator. This is so much fun. This, this, this is great. Uh, the, the not feminine here is not, you can't reach a level by your training in voice, in your speech training, normally. Because this state here, what I'm describing here, okay, is beyond sex already, beyond gender already. Right? train just as a singer trains. A speaker trains his voice as an instrument. Yes. As a singer right. trains her voice. Right. The, the singer trains his or her voice to reach that range, right? Speaker. Speaker, same thing, okay? And they get better as they practice. 
Okay, hopefully, since I started to lecture, hopefully my voice will get better <laughs> if I have more chances, have more practice. But, but, the not feminine, feminine here transcends gender. You see, when we, see, this is why the concept is so fascinating. This is, this is to me, when I look at this eight sounds here, this is a work art. The Buddha's voice, the Buddha's sound, is an incredible masterpiece that I want to share with you. Some of the minimal aspects that, are, that give you a glimpse of what it is, that I can't describe to you. Okay? Remember, his wisdom is cannot be described. Same thing, his voice cannot be described. Does it make sense to you? And there is this state here transcends gender already. Okay? So when we explain it to you, we we try to explain the, the things that we that that would uh, negate that state. Is femininity would negate that state because it still has a gender concept in there. Okay? The Bodhisattva, for example, are no longer gender uh, 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 specific. Bodhisattvas, you could call them male, you could call, call them female. No more gender. Male and female are because of our notion of duality that brought us in, into a state of, of opposites. Okay, so to explain the the fifth aspect of his voice is not fem feminine to, to me really to mean that really it transcends gender. If we were to use a word at all, it's masculine. To better fem not feminine, but actually it's it's beyond that. And that's why I, I encourage you to listen to to Venerable Hung Tru, and you will come back to me and say, "But she sounds like a woman to me." I say. You listen more closely. Uh, you keep on listening. You can record her voice. You listen to her. Okay. And then you take that recorder. Okay. And then you ask someone else, another female, for example, to repeat, read the same thing to you, for you. Let me tell you, you cross your legs and you listen carefully. You see a world of difference. That's what I'm talking about. It's not feminine. Well, it's not the same as the Buddha's level, but it's in that range, in that spectrum already. Am I making sense to you? Okay. Okay, that's not feminine. And number six is not wrong. Uh, he, uh, uh, his voice is well enunciated, speaks very clearly. So that um, one of the consequences is that when you hear whatever he explains, he doesn't utter, utter the wrong word. He doesn't say something that he doesn't mean to say. Okay? Why is that? Why, why does it happen? He doesn't vocalize because it says the truth. Vocalize. <laughs> one thing is that, is that you meant, you, you're distracted. Okay, I want to say something, but suddenly I hear, I, I noticed that he's falling asleep and bothered me. <laughs> you know? So it's not a case. He meaning this somewhere in this direction. Okay, and as always, I, I thought I wanted to say something, but huh? How are you there? How dare you fall asleep on me? You distracted. Okay, that's one reason. There's many, many more reasons. But anyway. Uh, the Buddha is beyond that. Whatever he says is exactly what he means. Not a single word is extra. Whatever he wants to teach you in this assembly is must all be there. You take our word, you lose so much 
you take out syllable, you take out a a um, a uh, an a, it loses its meaning completely. Okay, so uh, and for for that reason, the the reason for that is that it it enables you to have the proper views. Okay. And number seven, profound and pervasive. Profound and pervasive. Is there profound in meaning? Profound refers to death. And pervasive refers to place. It goes deep and wide. So it reaches everywhere that you can imagine. All right? And physically, when you listen to the Buddhist lectures, even though you're very far away, even though the hall may be very big and there's no microphone, all right, you're very far away, the sound reaches you at the right level. Whether you're hearing aids, you need to wear hearing aids or not, makes no difference. It's just perfect for you. All right. When that happens, does it mean that he has to scream to the person who sits right in front? No. The person in front is the same. The, the voice, the sound reaches that person at the appropriate level. You could call it spiritual power. Mm -hmm. So that's the nature of, of the sound. And, and enables us to grasp the to reach greater depths in the principles that he explains all right and number eight is unending in uh, meaning and time the sound that he produces never ends the lectures are unending if you have spiritual powers you can still listen to his lectures why because this reflects his vows, the nature of his vows are limitless in time. Okay. All right, any questions? The first part of the sutra is called the Sutra Preface. The world honored one had attained the way, he thought, to leave desire behind and to gain calmness and tranquility is supreme. He abided in deep med meditative concentration and subdued every demon and externalist. The world honored one is the title of the Buddha it's one of the ten titles of the Buddha. And it refers to the fact that the Buddha is the most honored in this world. All right? He's more honored than all Bodhisattva. He's more honored than the gods. That's why he's honored in the three realms in this world we live in. He's the, he's the most honored. All right? He came to our world. This is uh, called the Saha world. He came to our world a long, long time ago. Um, several thousand years, a few thousand years ago. But actually, he came to our world uh, waiting to become a Buddha quite a while back. Right now, the next Buddha, as you know, like many of you know, is Maitreya Bodhisattva. He's waiting. He's the next Buddha to be born to come to our world be Maitreya Bodhisattva. Okay? And the Buddha, his the Maitreya Bodhisattva right now is residing in a Tushita heaven. It's the fourth heaven in the desire realm. Teaching is teaching up there right now. He's waiting to become a Buddha. He's waiting to be born. Okay? By the time he be born, the average lifespan would be around eighty thousand help us. You know, 80,000 years. 
I'm sorry. That's how long it's going to be. The lifespan. Right now, our lifespan is about 60 years on the average. All right? That is, if you take uh, the people here who, who live to be 80s, women live to be 80s, men live in the 70s, and take Adam, average now with the people who live in Iraq, for example, or Afghanistan, or Darfur, okay, it evens out to about 60 years. All right? On the average. The Buddha, Shak, Shak, Shakyamuni Buddha, actually was in the, the Tushita heaven in our world when the average lifespan were 20,000 years. And then it decreased to 19,990 years. And then 19,980 years on the average, every 100 years. Okay? Until the average lifespan was from 20,000 years, okay, to 70, 70 years, that's when the Buddha was born in India. Okay, I explain that more in, in the future about how the world are go through its transformation, like just like we do, that we're born, we grow up, we grow old, we die, you know, of sickness. The worlds are just like that as well. And so the Buddha came to India and was born into the uh, pure king, the purized king in India. And when he was a kid, he was a young, he already exhibited extraordinary wisdom. For example, I, when he was six or seven, when I read this in the sutras, I nearly died. I was, I was so Green would envy because then back then I thought, hmm, if I love to meditate, I need to get into dhyanas, into samadhi. So the first level for me is first dhyana. Okay? I do anything to get into first dhyana because I want to know what it is like. That's the first milestone, significant milestone. When the Buddha was six, uh, there was a rice festival. They celebrated the a very successful harvest, and they they got together and they danced and they harvested and then and then they they, they they enjoyed they celebrated that. So the Buddha at 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 that time was around six or seven. So his nurses, uh, his nannies, would bring him to a hill overlooking overlooking the festival area. And in the shade so that he could be sheltered from the sun. Okay. And then they got distracted. The festival was so wonderful. So they turned their attention to the, to the festival and forgot about the Buddha. What did the small child do? The small child quietly went to a tree and drew to his calling, crossed his legs, sat under a tree meditated and entered what? Huh? Samadhi. samadhi. What Samadhi? At six years old, at seven years old, you think? Second Dhyana. He went second Dhyana in I said, huh? Oh, a kid? A child entering second Dhyana? And the sutra said, at that time, there was a caravan driving by the tree. A hundred oxes and horses carrying uh, carts loaded with merchandise and people walking and whipping the animal of burden. And the Buddha sat there. And he didn't even know. That's how deep his samadhi level is. How do you figure? Let's say a hundred ox carts carrying heavy loads going by you. How long do you think that's going to last? Take at least half an hour, I'd say. And he sat there. Didn't even know. His, his mind emptied out. That's how deep his samadhi level is. Okay? 
when he was uh, he's pretty bright and he, he he very erudite he learned a lot of skills and he, in, in the Indian tradition he learned all the skills necessary necessary to become a king he was being trained to be a king and at the age of 16 17 16 he his father ordered him to court his future wife the daughter a beautiful daughter of a neighboring kingdom. Okay. Uh, young Buddha, I forgot what her age was, like 13, maybe 12, maybe. I don't know. And so the Buddha went there and, and uh, composed poems for the princess and offered it to her. Of course, nowadays we, we, we sell, we call what? Uh, Taylor flower, what what what's it, the Conroy flowers, and then and they fill out a small card for us and say you know, you know, whatever. Uh, the Buddha composed poems and then sent flowers over to 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 uh, court the princess, and then he would uh, uh, show off his writing skills, his archery skills, his his swordmanship. And then the empress, the the the, uh, the the princess was so impressed, and the Buddha was so good looking too that that didn't didn't hurt that uh, she agreed to to marry him at a pretty young young age. Okay. Um. And but the Buddha uh, very quickly by the age of nineteen he he uh, realizes that. Um, he's uh, whatever the luxury and happiness that he experienced so far was still incomplete. He's still one thing that he still doesn't have an answer for is the suffering that you experience, let's say from birth. Birth is a rather painful process, or even the aging process is rather painful. Your body is dying on you. He's dying out on you. Okay? It hurts. Uh, many of you have arthritis. Okay? That's a very common thing. And you take medication, and it helps a little bit. It also compounds problems because medication leaves residues. Okay? So, so he, he, he's not happy and he, he decided to leave the home life, became a shramana. A left home person back then. Back then, there's no Buddhism. Remember, it was not available yet, because in the ancient Indian uh, wisdom, they said, if you want to obtain liberation, if you are into transcendental pursuits, remember, transcendental. I explained last time to them is to transcend the desire realm to reach first dhyana. Okay, that's called transcend, transcending the world to them, but. In their tradition, to transcend uh, this this worldly uh, wor uh, uh, home, you have to lead the home life and practice as a left home person. So he left home practice. Okay, but by the time he left home, his uh, father got worried. He sent five of his relatives to pursue the Buddha and talk him into coming back. Uh, two uncles from the maternal side and three uncles from his paternal side. These are all royalties, okay? They went, caught up with the Buddha, and said, uh, Prince Siddhartha, please come back because uh, your, 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 your father orders you to come back. The Buddha said, My father? Huh, I no longer have a father. See? Why he shaved his head? That's why. Because if he didn't shave his head, he would have to come back. Because he's still a son of his father. Does it make sense to you? The beauty of these stories, all these intricacies and small details are all in, in, intricately woven together in his life story. So he said, I'm sorry, uncles. I'm sorry that you to to make you go through all this trouble. But you know what? I have no more father. 
I call you uncle because I out of respect. Like you really no longer my my uncles. And these five guys stood there stupefied. They said, What are we gonna do now? You go back, can't face the king. We fail. So these guys had no choice but to follow the boom and practice, hoping that for a chance to make him change his mind and bring him back. Okay, so they followed him to practice with him. And uh, that's how it came about. He, he went to practice and after he became enlightened, he spent five years, nine years, this is kind of interesting, he spent five years seeking out the Dharma. The first five years of his practice to seek out teachers. Okay? If he want to practice the transcendental Dharma, the wisdom here is you have to have a teacher. They have to teach you the proper method. All right. So he spent five years of his life going from teacher to teacher. He'd go to a teacher who in very two famous teachers back then, one in seventh, Samadhi, okay, very famous throughout India. They're known to be the best there is, okay, the wisest teachers. And one is in seventh Samadhi, he went there for a year and then very quickly, he reached seven samadhi, and his samadhi is even deeper than his own teacher. He was so impressive, and he has so so many so so impressive that even his teachers, pupils, would follow the Buddha and teach and learn from the Buddha. And so the Buddha said, "Oh, okay, that's all I can do here. I don't want to steal my teacher's pupils." So he left his teachers and the pupils, and move on to the next teacher who's in the eighth level Samadhi. Okay? That's as high as you can get back then. And again, very quickly, he reached eighth Samadhi, and like the, the boy who sat under the tree for half an hour and not even knowing what's going on, his Samadhi power is so deep that he surpassed his own teacher in no time. And again, his teacher's people would then realize that and learn from him. And he said, hmm, he's no good either. But then after all this work, after, after all the wisdom I can acquire that's available in mankind, okay, the best of them can still not help me escape birth and death and my suffering. So what's left? There's no one else left to teach him. You see, the beauty of the story is that you seek out all the teachers and make sure you learn everything you can. Okay? And then he realized that now he's even wiser than his teacher. Okay? And he says, the next available teaching is that now you have to go into ascetic practices. So he went into the Himalayas and practice ascetic practices for six years, six whole years, eating one grain of wheat and one grain of rice a day. What do you think? Was he hungry? Or is he crazy? Any guess? You think he, he's hungry? No, I have a no. Anyone else? Two no's? Any dissension? Yes, who is very hungry. Of course you're hungry. As long as you have a body, you don't eat, you're hungry. But that's suffering you want to experience suffering. But the beauty of the Dharma is that of course, you may not be, okay, the first day you eat one grain of rice and one grain of wheat. The first, the first day, your stomach's going to growl like crazy. It's for hours and then, right? And you're so hungry for hours and hours. And then the second day is better. And the third day is better. 
it lessens and lessens, right? It takes a little bit longer before you can feel hunger pangs. Am I making sense to you? Because as long as you have a body and you have outflows, you will feel hunger, my friend. I don't care no matter how much smarter you have. No one ever explained to you that Dharma has, has a... The hunger Dharma is so wonderful because... <laughs> because... Don't be misled into thinking that because this cultivator, the extraordinary man here, has so much power that he should not have to bear hunger, and therefore this is a farce. That's wrong. He endured hunger like you would not believe. You buy that? See, I, I sometimes say white lies. <laughs> Feel free to contradict me. Okay? So but let me tell you, the Kung Fu, the Dharm behind this Kung Fu is so wonderful because if you practice it, and I don't recommend it for you, by the way. There's much more beyond, beyond that. What I explained to you is that hunger is a real thing as long as you have a body. And if you learn to deal with that, you learn to use that in your cultivation, it's incredible feat you can, you can attain so quickly. Okay, so after six years of doing that, of practicing that very powerful dharma, okay, including hunger, he said, I can move mountains. Okay, time is up. I can't believe it. <laughs> I can move mountains. I can dry oceans. I still can't end my suffering. I still feel hunger pangs. You see that? He still knows suffering from hunger. That's why he realized that he hasn't ended it yet. QED, that's the end of my proof. Because if he had no more hunger pangs, he would experience no more suffering from hunger. He would say, I made it. I ended my suffering. But no. He still has not ended his suffering. One of his sufferings. And he, is, and he says, this Dharma is not ultimate. This ascetic practices will not. See, I, I, I did, I went to, for the extreme. I did things that no other human beings can possibly even dream of doing. Okay? Le leave alone their doing, their the tribe. I tried it for six years. I made my point. It's not working. It's not the ultimate dharma. So he gave up, got into uh, aid, uh, received received an offering from a milkmaid, a heavenly maid. See, the, the, the gods are watching him, guarding him the whole time. Uh, made an offering, and then the Buddha accepted it. And then he went uh, down the mountain, found a Bodhi tree, sat down there and said, I'm not going to stand up until I become enlightened. He sat there for 49 days. At night, he saw a bright star. And then he became enlightened. That's how he attained the way. I got to the beginning of the second sentence. No, you're done. Just stand up. I don't want to be done. For tonight. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's all you get for tonight. Mm. Mm. Okay, let's wrap it up. Let's <laughs> The, uh, <laughs> don't, you you wouldn't believe it, but the 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 sutra lecture is going to much deeper teaching than I can teach you in Chan teachings. Chan teaching is more into I describe you how to do it. I teach you how to do it to get to the next level. Okay, in this thing here, I teach you how to build your heavens. Okay?
it's much more death. Okay, and that's why that's why the, the teaching is, is is much much deeper. This is all right. Let's do. May these merit and virtues adorn the Buddha's pure land, repaying the four kinds of kindness above, aiding the threefold paths below. May those who can see and hear all bring forth the Buddha heart. And when this retribution body is done, be all born in a land of utmost bliss. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, uh, comments on the format or suggestion that we need to change? I don't think we need it. Huh? We probably don't need as big of a place, don't you think? I love place because it has a sound. Okay. Uh, so I don't mind it because because uh, because uh, I probably would learn how to use a wireless microphone. Open the mic, the mic, uh, the the, the uh, styrofoam box. You see what I just got. Uh, um, Roberta, please bring it back to the front table so that. Yeah, see, if you learn how to use it, we have sound and we, we can practice the, uh, the, the first half hour. The first half hour is pretty cool, Dharma, really. You see, it takes some time. Yeah, leave it. So, so it's a, this is the cordless microphone and uh, it's going to help me uh, give you have more control over the, uh, the sound production. Uh, so, so that's why I like I like this place for that reason. If we go to a smaller place or a different place, I need to have sound, some kind of sound. Uh, all right. Um, all right. Please help uh, wrap things up. We, we uh, our time is up. Yeah, the small thing goes in the plastic plastic box. Uh, can I ask you to uh, what? Oh no, my goal is to only go to the CD like the plastic uh, uh, RJ, also uh, give something to your brother because I have something for him. Uh, uh, this is for him. I saw the thing. This is for you as you request it. Only the extension cord is not ours, the rest is ours. I will put it simply put it on on in the car. Oh, that's good.